Okay, Hart Crane, Ave Maria. So I'll just read the first stanza. Okay. Be with me, Louis de Saint Hell now. Witness before the tides can rest away. The word I bring, O oh you who reigned my suit, into the queen's great heart that doubtful day. For I have seen now what no perjured breath of clown nor sage can riddle or gainsay. To you too, Juan Perez, whose counsel fear and greed adjourned, I bring you back, Cathay. All right, good. So Columbus is writing to Louis de Saint Angel, and he's mm -hmm. also referring to Juan Perez. Those are people who helped get him. Um, they helped get. They helped persuade the king and queen. To fund his expedition. Um, and he's also writing um, as we'll see later on it seems that Columbus is writing at a certain time but it's not clear now exactly the time but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. I do also want to point out that this looks like a rare bilingual pun, but when Crane says, or Columbus says, oh, you who reigned my suit. So queen in French is, is Ren, which is spelled R-E-I-N. Mm -hmm. So reigned does look like a pun on the French for, for queen. Okay, you who reigned my suit. Of course, we think of the reigns of a horse initially, but this could be a play on reigned as in ruled. So I thought that there may be some... I got some slight ambiguity, which I think is deliberate. This could be Columbus, yeah. but it could also be Crane himself, I thought. Mm -hmm. So we have Columbus reaching out and speaking to these secular saints of exploration who aided Columbus. Yeah. You know, so... um. He's relying on these saints of exploration and navigation to get him across this ocean, which could be between birth and death, really. The ocean is not us with life. So it could be Columbus narrating. It could also be Crane relying on these parties and invoking uh, the names of all these different explorers and aides of Columbus to get intercession from Maria for his safe passage. It could right. be one of the other, Columbus or Crane. It could be, it could, it could be both, frankly. Um... Well, no, I think I think it's definitely just Columbus. And by the way, um, uh, remember I told you that in some editions they Crane wrote these glosses mm -hmm. on the right side of the page for his poems. Yes. And in some editions the glosses don't appear, but in the uh, in the original poems they have glosses. So for for this poem, yes. He says in the in the margin, Columbus alone gazing towards Spain invokes the presence of two faithful. Oh, well, I guess yeah. that resolves it. Yeah, but yeah, but even if that weren't his intent, I think the even if his intent were ambiguous, I think that ambiguity could carry through legitimately in the poem. Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. Okay. Uh, uh, one quick thought. So I like no perjured breath of clown nor sage could we look and say. We get the spectrum, one in the clown, one in the sage. So is he in the middle or is he just apart, apart from that spectrum entirely? I think he's just saying that... Maybe it's just something that cannot be answered. Like a wise man or a foolish man cannot deny... Okay, sure, sure, sure. Cannot cool. deny cool. this. Uh, I don't quite understand exactly what he means by perjured breath. Well, a stolen breath of clown or sage can little do and say. I guess if he's stealing the uh, stealing the ideas and the notions. Oh, well, let's see. For I, okay, so for I have seen. What no perjured breath of clown or sage can do and say possibly just means that what he has seen no one else has seen before I don't know uh, and also um, whose counsel fear and greed adjourned that also was a little obscure to me 
Well, I think Juan Perez, who's counsel, fear and greed adjourn. I guess the counsel, his, his, his words is what he has, to, what the advice he is giving does not, it's not compelled by fear or greed. This is my reading personally. I kind of think it might mean the opposite. I kind of think it might mean that fear and greed adjourned. Fear. Oh, I see what you mean. So fear and greed, he is silent by virtue of fear and greed. Is that what you're saying? Let's let's look up. Yeah, let's do that. Adjourned. Um, see if there's like an, another meaning of the word. Yeah, because I'm thinking of just drawing to a conclusion. To uh, to defer or put off to another day, postpone. Um, to suspend proceedings. Uh, so if. Um, so that could mean whose counsel, so feared and greed suspended their counsel. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say this is a catastrophe? Do you get a sense of catastrophe in the first stanza? No, no, because they. Uh, he's he's successful. He brings he brings back news of Cathay to his partisans. That supported him. Well, I know I concur, um, but it says, "Witness before the tides can rest away the word I bring." Oh yeah, it seems so, suggestive of some loss at sea. Oh yeah, so in, in the in the stanzas that follow, yeah, it's clear that um, there's a reference to like during a storm, Columbus wrote down everything he could about the voyage, yes, and he put it in a cask. And he flung it out into the sea. Really? Wow. Meaning, if if he died, hopefully the cask would get back to Europe and people sure. would find out. About of course, it. of course, of course. Um, and then, of course, we got a notion of the tempest in the sea, uh, the angry sea in the second stanza. So you can go right ahead and read that. Yeah. Here waves climb into dusk on gleaming mail, invisible valves of the sea, locks, tendons, crested and creeping, troping corridors that fall back yawning to another plunge. Slowly the sun's red caravel drops light once more behind us. Okay. Uh, so I interpret... Um, well, I'm not 100% certain what climb into dusk on gleaming mail it's simply a description of the waves. I mean, it's nighttime. I mean, it's prior to dawn because it says, um, slowly the sun's red cow drops light. So this is it toward the end of evening. Um, the gleaming mail, that could just be the effect of the uh, of foam. Um, yeah. The gleaming, yeah, dusk, of the, uh, climbing into dusk and the gleaming. These are just like the heaving seas, the stormy seas, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I like, bear with me. It is, uh, and what, it's also commentary. Yeah, I, what, I I agree that this is a Columbus speaking now because it says, where our Indian emperors lie, that possessive refers to just the empire itself. Well, now they're claiming the... Uh, the they found that Eastern Passage or something to India, is that right? Yeah, they're claiming that as, um, yeah, the, the empire of the Indians. Right, of course. But by the way, I think invisible vowels of the sea, do you think that refers to the Gulf Stream? So I think it would just refer to tides in general, frankly. Well currents under the water. Yeah, but currents under the water Would, would they have known about the Gulf Stream back then though? I well, know. They, well you know, that's a stupid question, because I mean they're not saying the Gulf Stream, but I think it has to do with the motion of the motion of the waters, tides, currents, something like that, I think. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, locks and tendons, mm -hmm. crested and creeping. So locks, um, I interpret that as there are, so a canal lock. So a canal lock, you put your ship in it mm -hmm. and you stay there until the water raises you up and then you can get to the, uh, you can progress. So maybe a lock here is a place where the ocean is kind of stationary. Um, I, but I don't really think that that ties in with the the, 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 um, the climbing waves and the cresting and the creeping and the troughing. The locks. Um, I mean, they're being anthropomorphized. 
We have tendons. We have locks. I, I think of almost like I've heard the uh, Poseidon's uh, um, symbolic animal was the horse. So I'm thinking maybe we're trying to look, like they have charging uh, for, uh, charging horses, basically is what I'm thinking. Um, but how does a horse relate to a lock? Locks, as in the mane. Oh, oh, oh. So you, oh, okay. That's an idea. I think so because it also says crested mm -hmm. right there. So maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll show that, that that's possible to bear with me. Let me uh, let me write that down. Okay, um, and then tendons I interpret as I I looked up to see if there was mm -hmm. um, something about the word that I was not understanding. Right. And sometimes it's defined as a long wire shaped thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe the crests on the waves, they look like like wire-shaped wire shaped objects. Well, I feel he's treating the ocean and the waves as living things. So if we take the horse metaphor, tendons are just those ligaments on which movement depends, really, for running, leaping, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking tendons are just... Um, uh, it, it, it's just one more word implying that these are living organic things. Mm -hmm. Hence, the, like Poseidon's horses, for instance. All oh, right. And then what about... Because, I'm so, I'm so sorry, crested and creeping. Those are motion. The words indicating motion. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess tendons could just mean reference the capacity for motion. Okay. Now, what about tro trowing corridors? Troughing corridors. Troughing. These are corridors between waves. Yeah. So yeah. The, you got you got a wave here and a wave here, and then there's a corridor. Precisely. That, okay. Precisely. But uh, and then fall back, yawning to another plunge. Sure. What I'm thinking is, so you got two waves like this, mm -hmm. and then the ship goes over a wave, and then it goes down. Right. It plunges down. I see what you mean. Frankly, though, it says troughing corridors that fall back. So these are just the corridors. The waves are like the uh, walls, if you want, and they just collapse in that wave, like in, in the motion of waves, basically. Mm. Okay, you could say that. Uh, what is the meaning of the word caravan? That's a that's one of the ships that Columbus used. A type of ship. Yeah. Okay. Ship. Cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. Okay, so the sun, and the, he's comparing the sun to a ship, like in ancient mythology. Mm -hmm. Apollo was, well, I think it was a chariot, but it might also have been a ship. So Apollo was racing the chariot across the sky. In Phaeton, you would call the myth of Phaeton, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, where are you getting that this is a ship? Well, the oh, carabelle. I see the carabelle, of course, of yeah. course, okay. So the sun's ship drops light once more. So the sun falls back beyond the horizon. Sure. All right, let me read, let me read some more. Okay. It's morning there, O oh, where our Indian emperies lie revealed, yet lost all, let this keel one instant yield. I thought of Genoa, and this truth now proved, that made me exile in her streets stood me more absolute than ever, biding the moon till dawn should clear that dim frontier first seen. All right. So I thought of Genoa and this truth that made me exile in her streets. Either he's forced out of Genoa for some reason, or he chooses exile for the sake of exploration. Well, he that's could've... actually that's actually a better interpretation because I thought it was that he was exiled from Genoa because he had crazy ideas. Right, but he was financed by royalty and all of that. So yeah, I just think he it was like a self exile. He couldn't stay there. He had to. Yeah, they indulge this urge to explore, and they might the Genoa might not have been rich enough to fund finance his expeditions. Not to, or actually, if that's his hometown, he just can't stay in his hometown. He wants to explore, basically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but also, um, what do you think? Yet lost all, let this kill one instant yield. Well, he's referring to the Ender in, uh, Indian emperors, lie revealed, yet lost. I think that's referring that he's losing this, if you will. Um, let this keel one instant... Yeah, yes, okay, yes, yes. So he's lost the Indian emperors if the keel one instant yield, if the ship wrecks. Mm -hmm. Just one instance, just one mistake is all it takes, the ship wrecks, and he, his crew, lose what they're seeking. Yeah, they lose everything, yeah. Okay, good. Um... Okay, so this truth stood me more absolute than ever. 
I take that to mean this truth is now more important to me than ever. Absolutely. Biding the moon till dawn should clear that dim frontier first seen. So yes. we know from his uh, diary that they thought they uh, spotted land in in the, at midnight around midnight yes. when the moon was, but they couldn't be certain of it until the dawn arose. Or it could just be they're just following by nights, and ultimately um, they're following the moon or going by moonlit at night. And then the dawn reveals something they had not seen before, a new frontier. Yeah, um, biding the moon. Yeah, I I have a little trouble. Like, does that mean they're waiting for the moon to go down? Um, biding the moon till dawn. Yeah, that's my, that's my thinking. All right. Okay. Cool. So the cons, the cons, great continent, then faith, not fear, and I surged me witless, hearing the surf near. I, wander breathing, kept the watch, saw the first palm chevron, the first lighted hill. So, of course. Oh, that's con. K, that should be, yeah, usually spelled K H A N. Yeah, so well, that's all Chad. I'm thinking like, uh, I was thinking like of China or something. It's con for a. Uh, yeah, it's the archaic spelling. Got it. So it would seem here that he has, in fact, discovered land. Mm hmm And when he hears the surf, you can only hear a surf when there's land. Of course. Yeah. So he hears the surf, um, and he sees the first palm chevron, the first lighted hill. Mm hmm So he sees land. Anything else you want to... Uh, no, 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 no. Let's go with uh, stanza four. Okay. And lowered, and they came out to us crying... The great white birds, O oh Madre Maria, still one ship of these thou grant us safe returning. Assure us through thy mantle's ageless blue, and record of more floating in a cask, was tumbled from us under bare poles scudding, and later hurricanes may claim more pawn. So I guess the floating in a cask, that record is what you were talking about. Yeah. Which he tosses out of the board, sure. So Great White Birds is pretty obvious. This is the reaction of the natives. Mm hmm And the Great White Birds, I guess, would be in reference to the uh, sails of the boats. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Madre Maria, still one ship of these. Uh, yes, yeah, still one ship of these. So he's saying that, you know, there were, th how many ships were there? Of there were three. three. Yeah. Pinto, Santa Maria, and... Pinta, well, the, Nina Pinto and Santa Maria. Right, and he's saying that it, it provided just one of those ships returns with this news back to the, back to his country. Yeah, that's ideal. If not, he's cast the he. There's this cask which he's thrown off a board. Yeah, and um, by the way, uh, Kramer thinks that uh, the title of the poem uh, Maria refers to the, the ship, ship versus versus okay yeah versus Mother Maria. Okay, well, that, that that seems sensible. Sure, sure. Yeah. And also, um, Kramer points out that ageless blue, apparently blue is associated with uh, the Virgin Mary. That's like her. And I think mantle's ageless blue could also refer to the blue of the, maybe the blue of the sky. Could be the mantle's ageless blue. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure on that. Um, I guess he's saying, assure us to that mantle so ages to like, give us fair weather to guarantee a safe return to the country, to Europe. Yeah. And by the way, I don't understand the f the first two words and lowered. Yeah, this was interesting. Um, it could mean like we we lowered ourselves from the ship, or yeah, or we lowered the, the anchor the sails, or something. Or lowered. The yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. All right. I like this though. And later hurricanes may claim more pawn. Yeah. But so that more pawn ends with, I can't tell. Is that, is that a. Three dots? Yeah, three dots. Is that what I'm saying? On the ellipses, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So let's start with the next line and then go on to the uh, next discussion. Okay. For here between two worlds, another harsh, this third of water tests the word low here. Bewilderment and mutiny heap whelming. Laughter and shadow cut sleep from the heart, almost as though the moors flung scimitar, found more than flesh to fathom in its fall. Okay, 
Now, I don't understand what this third world refers to. So he says... The ocean. Between two worlds of yep. the harsh. This third of water. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world of water. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you wanted to talk about mutiny? Yeah, I well, it says bewilderment, mutiny. I think what just this is saying is that nothing is really guaranteed. There are uh, there's an absence of law. There's an absence of. Let me see. Well, it's interesting. It says bewilderment and mutiny, which are I guess really negative experiences when you're at sea, yet they heap whelming laughter. What do you make of that? Well, uh, Kramer thinks that. And I think he's right that mm-hmm. um, Columbus refers to a lot of mutinies in his outbound voyage. In going, his outbound voyage? Yeah, going to the islands. Okay. But was, still, it says heap whelming laughter. Maybe it's uh, the, 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 the laughing of the mutineers. Um. Oh, and uh, I looked up whelming to see if there's a different meaning of the word. Sure. It, sometimes it means capsizing. Oh, okay. Oh, the, oh, interesting. Interesting. So, but we'll hear bewilderment. So, bewilderment could be just unfamiliarity with the terrain, mm-hmm. shoals, storms, that kind of thing, and the mutiny, mutiny as well, which would uh, sabotage the voyage. I guess you could say. Yeah. I'm still a little unclear on use of the word laughter. Yeah, unless, I am too. Unless that refers to the mutineers. It could be like mad laughter. That too. That too. And a shadow cut sleep from the heart almost as the moor's flung scimitar found more than flesh to fathom in its fall. Yeah. Now, um, Kramer does point out that Columbus said he had trouble sleeping at certain times. Mm-hmm. I think it's there was a, a large storm um, around February 12th or 13th, okay. 1493. Sure. And when he recovered from that storm, they went to the, the Azores and they went to a shrine of the Virgin and gave Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that shadow cutting sleep from the heart does refer to insomnia, but... Like overwhelming worry robbing one of sleep, basically. Yeah. Okay, okay. But the, the last two lines, I disagree with Kramer's interpretation, so... The Moors' scimitar. I think that refers to the moon. That's what. That's exactly what I. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yes. And I looked it up, and there is a, a website that say that, that says that the the Muslims do believe that the uh, the crescent moon, like on their flags, yes. that that does that that is like a scimitar. Mm-hmm. But the the website, as usual, doesn't state where they get this knowledge from. Understood. Understood. Uh, but I do think that what he's saying here is it's as if the moon, um, as it's, hold on, I wrote it down exactly. So, as though the moon did not simply set, it also kept us awake. Mm-hmm. So the moon is not simply setting, it's also keeping us awake. Right. Now, what do you think of found more than flesh to fathom in its fall? Obviously, it's an elder of line for occurrences of F. Um, so maybe that was one of the reasons for its inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, found more than flesh to fathom its fall. Flesh, I guess, because it would be human beings um, trying so to track the moon. It's not simply... Fathom, it's not simply thinking about right. flesh, it's causing insomnia. Um, I kind of interpret f- flesh to fathom, more than flesh to fathom. Flesh, I think, is fathoming the moon as it descends. Let's come back to it. Yeah, now let me that, also... If you have notes, please. Let me also read you what Kramer thinks. No, I, um, well, he also believes that fathom means dig into. He thinks that fathom means dig into here. Well, it's a it's a nautical measurement of depth. Fathom, mm-hmm. fathom. So let's see if we can do something to. But. Here, let me read you the uh, 
sure. framework's interpretation. So, so sure. um, the blow would come as if at the hands of the Moors, yeah. whose power in Spain ended under the reign of Isabella yeah. and Ferdinand. The Moors' iconic flung scimitar linked to the whelming sea by Crane's use of fathom to mean dig into would exact revenge even as it fell in defeat. So I'm wondering if the moon, the fathom, it, it seems that the moon is disappearing into the ocean. Mm -hmm, yeah. Hence the fathom part, that moon's disappearance prior to the sun rising. Um, so it's not only taking flesh as it goes beyond the horizon, it's also taking mind. So not only body, but also mind. Um, found more than flesh what's being fathomed is the fold of the moon and flesh or human beings fathoming or grasping the fold of the moon well I think the subject is is scimitar which is moon right but the verb I, is found and the object is more than flesh no I think the object ultimately uh, the flesh is fathoming the fold of the moon is my thinking which will correspond to the fact that, I mean, for, for navigation, they had to follow the moon, uh -huh. follow the signs of the sky. Um, I'm just still not clear when it says, hold on, found more than flesh to fathom. I think flesh just really refers to uh, the human beings fathoming or, or viewing the fall of the moon, is my thinking. But I'm still not clear on the use of the word, uh, of the phrase, found more than flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th what like I like I said, I think it means not only did it find body mm -hmm. to fathom, it also found mind to fathom. I, mean, I think it's more. I think it's a little too metaphysical, honestly. I think it, I think it's probably more simplistic than just saying it's a reference to navigation by night. Is my thinking. Yeah, but how do you how do you paraphrase it into something intelligible? Right, and in order to do that, I would need to work out what it means by... Uh, All right, well, let's let's come back. Of, yeah, we'll come back to it. That's fine. Back to it next week. Now, we still have to do a Yet Under Tempest Lash. Do you want to go from there? Yeah. Yet Under Tempest Lash and Surfeitings, some inmost sob have heard to swage the abyss, merges the wind in measure to the waves. Okay, so I think sob refers to the sailors afraid that they're going to be drowned because of the storm. And also, I would say perhaps prayer as well because it dissuades the abyss. Yeah, so they're they're praying to God to mm -hmm. not plunge them into the abyss. Right, and merges the wind in measure to the waves, so there's that congruence, and hence the tempest dies away. Um, no, I thought that meant, like, during the storm... Mm -hmm. The wind and the waves appear to be the same thing. No, well, uh, merges the wind in measure to the waves. Well, the, the, the dissuading of the abyss, I think, would be the abating of the storm, ultimately. And then merges no, the... No, 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 the sobs are praying... Right, and they successfully dissuade the abyss, which means that it, it, it brings them out of danger. So they're, they're, out, they're no longer in danger of sinking and drowning. And then that prayer basically has a pacifying effect on the wind and the waves, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So you're saying that the sobs warded off the abyss. Yes, by divine intercession, you could say. And made the wind and the waves one. It's like they're measured. So, so if you have a conflict of wind and waves, you're going to get this tempest, the ocean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. If there's that harmony, you think of it. Use the word harmony, for instance. Okay. And then, so if they're, they're out of danger because of these prayers. Is my thinking. Yeah, actually, I think that that does make more sense. So, the wind and the waves, if they're in harmony, then there's not this raging tempest coming in. Sure. Yeah, let me write that down. Okay. All right, next stanza, series on series infinite, till eyes starved wide on blackened tides, a crete enclose, this turning round your hole, this crescent ring, sun cusped and zoned with modulated fire, like pearls that whisper through the doge's hands. Okay, 
So I don't know if series on series infinite refers to infinite series, um, but I think it means the waves appear to be infinite. Precisely. Yeah, that's my interpretation. Now, till eyes starved wide on blackened tides, that could either mean the eyes are bored looking at the same thing, or the eyes is a synecdoche for the sailors, and the sailors are starved because they don't have enough food. Well, it says eyes starved wide. My interpretation is people have been waiting, like straining their eyes to, cap, you know, to uh, see land, if mm -hmm. you will. Okay. Uh, so yeah, till eyes starved wide on blackened tides, even at nighttime, they're trying to find. Um, any sign, any indication of the, that they're approaching land. Okay. Um, and then now this is interesting. Uh, Till I starved wide, a crit after blackened tides. Um, I was a little unclear on what a crit would mean. I guess maybe just the cumulative effect of all that watching and all that waiting, perhaps, mm -hmm. of all, trying to just see. So it's like almost like I, it implies exhaustion to me. Maybe yeah. even a lock of hope because they just don't see land as of yet. Now, I think that the, what follows the next three or four lines are my favorite. Um, do you want to go ahead and read that? Oh, do you, what, what do you think of those first two lines? So, uh, enclose this turning Ronger hole. That refers to the earth. Yes. And then this crescent ring also... Uh, the crescent ring is the the horizon. This is from Kramer. Mm -hmm. So the horizon looks like a crescent. It looks like an arch. The sure, horizon, sure, sure, of course. And then sun cusp. The cusp is um, where two arches meet, kind of like a keystone. Of course, yeah, sure. So the, the cusp sun could also just mean edge. Okay. As well. Yeah. So the uh, the sun is on a setting on the horizon, yes. and it's linking these two arches. And we have the effect with the clouds, the zones of modulated fire, that sunlight manifesting in the clouds and the horizon, that kind of thing. Well, zoned, um, I know this from my Latin studies, zoned means belt. Yeah, yeah, I think the, yeah, usually I'm, I think I've heard the term end zoned, but it would still be the horizon at like dawn or something. So I think, I think this means the, the earth is belted with fire. Meaning the sun. The sun is going around. Well, I would just say it could just mean refer to the uh, that horizon of 360 degrees all the way around, which is ignited by the dawn. Yeah, so the sun, the earth is belted with this uh, fire. Now, D-O-G-E, how did you pronounce that? Doge. Doge, and what is that? That's the, um, the leader of Venice. Okay. And he, uh, they have this ceremony where the Doge marries himself... Sure. To the sea. So, um... Delirium of jewels is... Well, hold on, hold on. Go ahead, we go. still got a... Sure. So, um... The, the sailors, like the doge, are being married to the sea. Okay. You think that's... Uh, let me... the doges. I'm not sure I would say that. Uh, good grief. Like pearls that whisper through the doges. Well, wait, yeah, well, let me go. It says, then it says, yet no delirium of jewels. Mm -hmm. I can kind of put this to mean that maybe well, there was an expectation of treasure and treasure was not found, perhaps? I interpret it as the jewels of this land are not just imaginary. They are, in fact, real. So it's not... An imagination of jewels. There are real jewels here. I see what you mean, but delirium I don't necessarily interpret as like an, uh, as like a, a vision of jewels. Rather, someone just gets so overwhelmed by jewels, versus like, well, what I'm looking at isn't actually a jewel. Right. I think I think Crane is giving a new meaning to the word delirium. Maybe delirium. Then maybe like they used to speak of things like. Um, gold madness or something someone would be so uh, obsessed with hoarding gold so to speak so delirium of jewels maybe like a maddened mono uh, monomaniacal striving for jewels or for wealth maybe I stand by my interpretation which is the jewels of this new land are not just imaginary they're real 
Yeah, well, 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 it's a minor point. We'll agree to disagree. He doesn't. He doesn't have a verb in this image, so right. it's a little, a little hard to interpret. Okay, so O oh, Fernando, take up that eastern shore, this western sea, yet yield thy gods, thy virgins, charity. So who's uh, so Fernando? He's basically saying yielding conquest of the world to Fernando. It says <laughs> there's gods, there's the virgins, charity. These are things that you need to yield unto God and not appropriate. No, I think, well, Kramer interprets this, and I think he's right, mm -hmm. that um, he's saying take the eastern shore and the western sea, yes, but yes. be kind and compassionate. Use Do it with the virgin's charity. Sure. Or at the very least, maybe don't claim... Uh, uh, having may, Don't claim an accomplishment or praise that should be yielded up to God. It's like they reach this... Um, they, they, re they, they arrive at their destination... Don't be so cocky and arrogant as to say you were like got there all by yourself, so to speak. Yeah. So it's like you, you you've conquered this empire, you've this vast vast uh, span of the earth. Give to God what is God's. Mm -hmm. and almost like, it's almost like a be humble, if you will. Yeah. And then the next two lines, I had a, a lot of trouble with these. Mm -hmm. Rush down the plentitude, and you shall see Isaiah counting famine on this lee. Rush down the plenitude. Um, so eventually, I one thing that helped me is yeah. I think rush down means diminish. What I think what he's saying is, uh, don't be a king such as, don't be a king like they were in the Bible where Isaiah had to come and preach at you. Mm -hmm. So don't diminish the plenitude. Don't take away everything. Right. So Because if you do take everything, then you're going to see Isaiah preaching about causing famine. My impression is the plenitude refers to uh, the wealth and the splendor of the new land. Yeah. But if you... Don't prioritize God and virgin. Ultimately, like Isaiah, you will yield only poverty. You'll find famine, um, that kind of thing. So it's like, it goes back to the previous, yield God, thy virgin's charity. Mm -hmm. And if you fail to do so, this is the consequence. Right. That despite the jewels, despite the, the fame, whatever, mm -hmm. you are ultimately going to come to ruin on this shore. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. And then... Lee, I think here means shelter. That or could, I, I, I took to mean like a shore. Yeah, shore. Sure. So you know you're rushing up and down the shore to to appraise all your wealth and, and your conquest. But if you don't yield to God, what is God's, and acknowledge the Lord and the role and the role He's played, you will come to ruin in spite of the wealth of this nation or uh, of this newfound land, like Isaiah counting famine on the lee, basically, which is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. Next. Next stanza. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. And herb, a stray branch among the salty teeth, the jellied weeds that drag the shore, perhaps. Tomorrow's moon will grant us saltus bar. Palos again, a land cleared of long war. Some angelus environs the cordage tree. Dark waters onward shake the dark prow free. So I interpret salty teeth as the... Um, the crests on the waves. Um, salty teeth. It could also just refer to the shore, uh, the effect of the, uh, you're probably right. It could also refer to the tide rushing in on the shore. Um, it could, it could mean the rocks. It could, I mean, salty, I mean, salty is obviously a reference to the salt of the ocean. Yeah. Uh, or a stray branch. I think these are the very mundane items they're finding on the shore, yeah. including the jellied weeds that drag the shore. Right. And by the way, I think Kramer is wrong here, but Kramer thinks that jellied weeds refers to the Sargasso Sea, and I don't, I don't think so because they're they're near the shore. Right. Well, the Sargasso Sea is way out in the midst of yeah, it's the way island. out in the middle. I think what this means is they're reaching the shore, and the first thing they're going to find is really kind of disappointing. Maybe a herd, a stray bench in the weeds. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we keep progressing in our explorations, tomorrow's moon will grant us. Saltus Salt bar. bar, a land clear of long war. That that refers to. Um, Is that just the crashing of the waves or something? No, Spain fought the Muslims for several centuries. 
Okay, a land without the war they're accustomed to. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And then some angel- angelos environs the cordage. That's of course uh, the, the roping on the tr- on the mast. Um, yeah, but angelos is a um, it's a Catholic prayer. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And then dark waters onward shape the dark prow, prow free. So the dark waters are compelling the ship to keep moving forward. Yeah. Go. So now he's addressing God directly. It looks like. Hold on a second. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he's he's uh, yeah he's addressing God directly. Mm-hmm. God sleeps on thyself, apart like ocean athwart lanes of death and birth. Um. So yeah, so for some reason God sleeps on himself, since he's since he's everywhere, since he's omnipresent. Well, it could actually sleep as long as it could just mean um, there's a term in theology called deity. Which refers to God's complete self de- uh, independence. Mm-hmm. So that's what it could refer to. Okay. And then uh, a part like ocean athwart lanes of dark and uh, death and birth. Let's see. Again, that may be referring to the same concept to say the um, Ocean athwart lanes. So ocean, the ocean is not reliant on or in contact with death and birth, and as such, it's like God is not influenced by or connected with death and birth. Or it could be. Um, the ocean gives birth to new creatures, and kills others. So the ocean has lanes of death. So the ocean both kills and gives birth. Well, I think the, uh, that goes back to the original metaphor I was thinking where ocean is representative of life between two shores, birth and death, which is my thing. But, so would you agree with me that it means uh, God who sleeps on yourself apart like the ocean, which both gives birth to new creatures and kills others? Um... I think it's possible I'm not yet willing to commit myself to that specific interpretation um, but I think he's comparing God to the ocean um, athwart lanes of birth, death and birth seems to me that, that like it's separate from or apart from death and birth if you will I'm still inclined to say that the shore one shore represents birth the other represents death and maybe mm. the ocean is unaffected by such no no because there are there are lanes Oh, sure, sure, sure. Within the ocean. No, 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 no. Lanes would be one lane uh, between one lane of birth, one lane of death. Hence, hence the plural. I think. No, I kind of think that there are there are lanes within the ocean. Has several lanes. I realize that, but if we, but again, we go back to hold on. Uh, from here, between two worlds, another harsh. This third of water. One world is death, one world is birth, and the ocean was what we run to between the two unaffected. Nah. Nah. Ye yeah, uh hold on. Well we'll show we'll read the screw on that one. Okay, alright. Um, and all the eddying breath between doth search cruelly with love thy parable of man. So God um, I think all the eddying breath between that refers to all the eddying breath between birth and death. So it's referring to the life of somebody. Yeah, and okay, so it searches cruelly with love God's parable of man it's like an existential thing I mean, the, the, I mean we, we ponder the nature of humanity the nature of life the nature of death that kind of thing that's what typifies life in general but um, but what so what's the subject here the, the eddying breath is searching right the eddying breath I believe is human life you refer to you know in gen- like the breath of life. in Genesis for instance breath is conveyed to a human being which the clay by uh, life is prefer- uh, life is given to the clay by the breath of God uh, 
eddying breath, eddying gives and takes. I think it just refers to human life more than anything else. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, so next stanza. Inquisitor, incognizable word of Eden, and the enchained sepulcher, into thy steep savannas burning blue, utter to loneliness the sail is true. So uh, Cranmer believes that inquisitor refers to God. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's referring to Eden and the sepulcher, so it's like the inquisitor condemns. Um, incognizable word could of Eden, I think, is probably maybe banishment from Eden, and then the sepulcher is the result, which is the fact that we're all enchained by death. Well, Kramer thinks that it refers to the birthplace, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is where Christ was born, mm -hmm. and it's enchained because it's in Muslim lands at this time. But that doesn't make sense to me because it says he's calling him as inqu an inquisitor. And the reason he's an inquisitor is because of these com this command, the incognizable word, which uh, the condemnation of man was uh, uh, expulsion from Eden. And then when it says the enchained sepulcher, I just think that means death, really. The fact that we are subjected to death as a consequence of being kicked well, out. Why is it enchained? Encha the enchained sepulcher. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Um, does it necessarily have to mean it's wrapped in chains or that function? Uh, I think what it means is there's a and also why is it capitalized? If it were uh, in lowercase, it could refer to any sepulcher. Sepulcher with an uppercase s refers to just death in general. I think. Now it just says enchained, which means I mean it's a standard in theology that God is in full control of death. Death does not run rampant outside of God's mm -hmm. will. His design. So my thinking is this. The inquisitor, the incognizable word. I mean, this is just the desire, the mandate of God. Um, and this is of Eden. Now, I, I thought of Eden could be the creation of Eden, but I think it means the expulsion from Eden, and the consequence of that is we're bound up to death, bound to death, we're enslaved to death. Well, I think it, it refers to God, but we're just arguing over why is God referred to this way. Right, precisely. So I think it would be something like, the word of Eden would be the warden of Eden, the guard of Eden. Mm -hmm. God is the guard of Eden. But he's only, why is there a guard? He's a guard because so that uh, humankind cannot return once yeah. kicked out. So we're basically saying the same thing, I think. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to stand by the interpretation of enchained sepulcher as death. Death, overall. All right, hold on. Okay, and into thy steep savannas burning blue, utter to loneliness the sail is true. So savannas would refer to the grasslands of the new world. It says burning blue, though. And it says unto, uh, utter to loneliness the sail is true. Steep savannas, I think, for it just means blue sky, blue water. But why would savannah refer to sky? Well, these are largely unex uh, uh, unexplored, I guess. I mean, uh, a sk uh. but I do, I do um, admit that because it says "thy," this this is God's savannas. So mm -hmm. why would why would God have savannas in the New World? He he has savannas everywhere. But I'm not referring to a literal savanna. I think it's just a metaphor for sky. For sky and sea. Yeah, you're me okay. Metaphor for sky and the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's probably a better a better uh, better interpretation. Now, as far as utter to loneliness, mm -hmm. the sail is true. I think loneliness refers to the the ocean is lonely because nobody sails on it. Or oh, it could also be that the boat itself is lonely because it's the only one of its kind in these savannas. I think both would. I think both interpretations yeah. would fit. Yeah. All right, let me write this down. Mm -hmm. Who grind this ore and arguing the mass subscribes holocaust of ships, O thou, within whose primal scan consummately the glistening signories of Ganges swim. Okay, so grinding the ore, that could probably be the ocean. Yeah, my thinking. Arguing the mass is the same thing, basically, hence the, hence the holocaust of ships. Um, 
I interpret arguing as exposes flaws in. I would just say arguing the mast. Uh, arguing I wouldn't take, li uh, obviously not literally. I think it just means it's, uh, struggling with the mast, inflicting damage on the mast, and uh, that would potentially cause shipwreck as part of the Holocaust to ships. I think that I think who grinds the oar, we can also say who arguing the mast. It's the same thing we're talking about, I think. And so the ore is what's being damaged, and the mast also could be damaged. Hence the possibility, you know, it's subscribes to the Holocaust of ships. Mm -hmm. And um, within whose primal scan consummately mm -hmm. the glistening signiores of Ganges swim. So, um, well, the primal scan is obviously God. Yeah. Consummately, I guess... Yeah, we're talking about God's perspective, for instance. Um, yeah, so seniors would be dominions or... Of course, of the Ganges, right, right. Right, they swim in God's scan. Yes. Okay, let's continue. Okay. Who send his greeting by the core percent... Which is... A, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And Tenerife's garnet flamed it in a cloud, urging through night our passage to the Khan, Te Deum Laudamus for thy teeming spawn. Well, core percent, I believe, is for what of the wisp. In um, uh, in, in a nautical context, as I recall, it's uh, Saint Elmo's fire. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What is now? I don't know what Tenerife's gone. That means. Tenerife is one of the islands of the Canaries, okay. and apparently Columbus saw a volcano mm -hmm. uh, erupting on one of these Canary Islands. Sure. And garnet means mineral. It's a kind of stone. It's got it right of course. Yeah. So the. Um, the the volcano is exploding these minerals flamed it in the cloud would refer to the volcano eruption i think flamed it in the cloud could also have a double significance being uh the phenomenon that was guiding the israelites through the desert yeah the so he land. sees he sees himself as being guided to the new world precisely by a pillar in a cloud and of course so by day it was a cloud by night it was fire urging a through night our passage to the Khan or in the Israelites terms passage to the new world uh, today I'm Ladamos we praise you God for thy teeming span sure right. okay of all that amplitude that time explores a needle in the sight suspended north yielding by inference and discard faith and true appointment from the hidden shoal this disposition that thy night relates from moon to Saturn in one sapphire wheel, the orbic wake of thy once whirling feet, Elohim, still I hear thy sounding heel. So I think this is rife with the imagery of navigation. Mm -hmm. um, needle inside, of course, with reference to the compass, but he's going by, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the compass, he's going by the night, night signs in the night sky to uh, avoid the hidden shore, for instance, any dangers, that sort of thing, and maintain the correct course. Yeah. And apparently, discard is, according to Kramer, it has an archaic meaning here. Discard means like inference. It's synonymous with inference. So, what well, also mean exclude uh, uh, um, yielding by influence, but also by exclusion. So it's like you see possibilities and exclude them as being yeah viable, right? So it's a noun here. It's not a verb. Right. I agree. And then I also think Crane's, he's got the and in the wrong place. So it should be inference, discard, and faith, or inference, discard, faith, and true appointment. I think they're just two pairs, yielding by inference and discord and faith and true appointment. I guess, but I guess maybe it would sound cumbersome with the additional and. I think it would make more sense if faith were actually fronting the, uh, fronting the next line. Well, I think the normal way to do it is if you have four items, mm -hmm. you say W, X, Y, and Z. Yes, precisely. But Crane has it W, N, X, Y, and Z. So the orbic wake of once thy once whirling feet, I think, just refers to the heavens, basically. Um, well, it's there, it's the, one sapphire wheel, so it's referring to, to, to the, uh, the wheel of heaven, if you will, mm -hmm. which is spun by god's feet. yeah yeah okay let's read the next stanza mm -hmm. white toil left white toil of heaven's cordons mustering in holy rings all sails charged to the far 
hushed gleaming fields and pendant seething wheat of knowledge. All right. Um, well, I thought that what would uh, white cordons of heaven would be the, the the clouds. I think mustard and holy rigs. So, so I feel that this is the this is the. Uh, this is the objective. All of these sails and all these explorers are going to converge on this land with, uh, there will be more, uh, you know, the, the objective of exploration is the gleaning fields and the seething wheat of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the ideal is, all, I, I, well, let me, I, holy rings and all sails charged. Yeah, I think this is the objective, is that ultimately all more and more ships are going to come to the new world and reap the benefits of the new world. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, next stanza. So I think we're on... Round thy brows and hooded now, yep. the kindled crown, a seated of the poles, and biased by full sails, meridians reel, thy purpose still one sure beyond desire. So I think the kindled crown refers to these clouds lit by uh, the sun at dawn. But I thought I thought it referred to uh, the crown of Spain and he's been granted remember how the Pope divided the world into the Spanish part and the Portuguese part? Sure, sure, of course. But that doesn't quite make sense because the Pope didn't grant the North and South Pole mm-hmm. to Portugal and Spain. So that's the problem with that interpretation. I think simply put, uh, the, uh, the kindled crown is the same thing as the toil of heaven's cordons, mustering and holy rings. I think it's just the kindled crown is the clouds, the by dawn, the by the sun. Yeah, that's probably. Uh, and then it says, uh, meridians will be the highest points. Mm-hmm. Real thy purposes. Do you think maybe they just... Um, it almost sounds like they're, they're reeling from astonishment at the possibility of God's... I have real here as draw out. They're drawing out God's purpose. Like reeling... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it means real like, you know, I, I reel in astonishment. So I don't to speak. think so. Because normally, in that sense, real is intransitive. Mm-hmm. Like we're reeling, or yeah, that was curious. I thought maybe drawing out thy purpose, though. They expose your purpose. The meridians. Maybe they're just trying, but but, but then again, how does that happen? How, how, how do meridians do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the meridians. Well, well, let's look it up uh, real fast. So Kramer has the Earth's newly mapped meridians now circling the globe according to Columbus's erroneous reckoning are crossed on the diagonal biased. So diagonal means biased mm-hmm. here by the full sails passing between the old world and the new. So maybe hold on. Let me do it. The great wheeling, reeling. So we, reeling is a synonym for wheeling. So the great wheeling or reeling system of circles resembles the wheels within wheels of Ezekiel and Shelley, which constitute God's kindled crown. The meridian lines crisscross by sails resemble the harp-like cables of the bridge. I think he's gone way too far with that, honestly. But uh, it says, uh, uh, yeah, the meridians, etc. These just these these representations encompass the entire world. They real. They, they surround the world, and the, that is God's purpose. That world. I think it just may refer to like a. It could be a cartography metaphor, actually. Well, charting the world, charting God's. Yeah, but that's what Kramer is saying. Okay. Okay. Well, he, well, he was getting into like uh, the chariots of Isaiah or something. Of or Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Right. Right. And I think that goes a little too far. I think it's just um, this is the consequence of exploration. We're going to map out the known world as God created it. Okay, but. Um so the meridians um, the meridians refer to the lines of longitude yes and they are crossed by the sails of Columbus mm-hmm. um, 
Oh, yes, it's seated at the poles, the North and South Pole. Mm -hmm. So I think it just means exploration is going to encompass and chart out the full breadth of creation. But what does a seated here mean? Does it mean given? No, let's see. What are some uh, let's see. high schools are? Yeah, I'm not sure. A seated of the poles. I just think it's this is the what we're seeing here is the endpoint of ex the ideal endpoint of exploration. But you're not answering the question. But I see. I, I'm not. I'm not clear exactly the meaning of what. Yeah. Do you have the? Uh, now a seed normally means given or grant. I mean, I can let me look up see if there's some other obscure meaning of the word. Come forward, approach, arrive at, join oneself, become a party. All right, there you go then. The poles are joined via exploration. It, it refers to that metaphor of the world being known and mapped out and explored as a whole. So the meridian will be left, it will be, will be long, uh, latitudinal, and then from north and south pole will be longitudinal. So what's, what, what's the subject? What's being acceded of the poles? Maybe, maybe he, uh, maybe he means the kindled crown uh, joined, joined the poles. No, nah, that doesn't work. Okay. All right. Uh, the seas, green crying towers, a sway beyond. And kingdoms naked in the trembling heart, te deum laudamos, O thou hand of fire. Well, it says still one shore beyond desire, which could be that ultimate shore, like paradise maybe, heaven. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah. Okay, so the sores, the seas, green crying towers, is, is this the waves? I would think so, yes. Yeah, sway beyond. And kingdoms naked in the trembling heart. Oh, today, uh, today I'm Ladamos, O oh, thou hand of fire. Sure, sure. And Kramer interprets hand of fire as coming from a passage in St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine's cauldron of unholy loves. Well, it's also a, it's also a reference to T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. So the, so the Eliot is referring to Augustine in the Wasteland. And Crane is referring to Eliot. That may be taken away too deep. Well, hold on. No, ahead, so in the wasteland, it says, To Carthage then I came, burning, burning, burning. O Lord, thou pluckest me out. O Lord, thou pluckest, burning, burning. That sounds very similar to, who was it? Um, Jonathan Edwards, Sitters in the Hands of an Angry God. I feel like I've encountered that term hand of fire or something along those lines before when it comes to Puritan literature. But yeah, but why Crane is, if he's referring to um, St. Augustine here, it's not clear why he would be doing that. Right, I, 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 I'm not convinced that that's a proper conclusion to draw. I may be stretching up a little bit. Yeah. All right. So I think we're just going to have to chalk that up to not known. Sure. Okay. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. All right. Awesome.